Hey, welcome to the show. I have with me Tamisha Sales from Community Action Partnership of North Alabama. And today we're going to talk about what you need to know about designing a board and program development. But before we hop into that, let me give a plug for the Nonprofit Architect Alliance Mastermind Group. It's a low, low barrier of entry at 50 bucks a month. Get in, get on board with other nonprofit leaders, figure out what your roadblocks are, and we'll get you some clarity in your next steps, and we'll get those donations flowing to you today. Tamisha, how are you doing today? I'm well. Thank you for asking. How are you? Hey, I am doing wonderful. I told you why before the show, but we're the day after the election right now when we're recording this, and uh, we don't know who the president's going to be on January 20th, but... Uh, that doesn't really matter. See, Tamisha and I have discovered that the president doesn't determine our happiness, and we're just going to go on and be ourselves regardless of who's picked. Um, but that being said, I hope it's not awful. <laughs> 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 uh, Tamisha, why don't you uh, tell us what you do with Community Action Partnership of North Alabama? Yes, yeah, so there is a large nonprofit covering 17 counties in North Alabama. And there I am a senior programs director and primarily my, I have worked every position in the nonprofit from a volunteer all the way up to leadership. But right now, um, my role is mainly building and sustaining partnerships. We identify community needs and my job is to go out there and build connections and sustain them and create partnerships. Um, that goes from holding focus groups, community assessments, counting the homeless, to lead a presentation at a conference, a regional events. So you wear many hats in the nonprofit world, but my title is director, senior programs director. So that's what I do every day. Yes. Well, that's sounds... every day is different. Yeah, each day is different. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's one of the reasons I like this so much is I get to talk to wonderful people like yourself that are doing all sorts of different crazy missions. And I know you guys are really focused on reducing the causes and the consequences of poverty. And that's something close to my heart, being as I grew up in trailer parks and foster homes. So the yes, we we exist because of Linda B. Johnson, the launch that war on poverty. There are community action agencies throughout the United States. Um, each one has a different name, but they're all community action agencies, and they receive federal dollars that's blocked off these blocked grants to address needs in the community and to fight this war on poverty. And so eventually we always say that we hope to be out of business one day, but it doesn't look like we're going to put ourselves out of business because community needs keep changing. Diversity is causing demands on programming and partnerships and it just keeps evolving. Yeah. <laughs> that is, that is definitely true. I know that, you know, in my situation, it, I give a lot of credit to a lot of the, the people that poured into my life and everyone you encounter especially growing up like I do, there's something presented to you and you have the choice to accept what they're giving you, whether that is kind words, negative words, a word of advice, or you, know, you have the chance to reject that. Um, but I found it, I think in my path that much more, many more people accept whatever is presented to them without knowing how to really properly question that. And, and what ends up happening is, uh, I, I forget who told the story, but you know, he went to a funeral and he met uh, each of the, the twin brothers that were there. Their dad had passed away uh, as a result of alcoholism. And the first brother they talked to, uh, he was visibly drunk at the funeral and he said, hey, what's, what's going on? What's up with your life? He's like, can't you see that I'm an alcoholic? You know, I said, well, why are you an alcoholic? He's like, you see, my father was an alcoholic. I, I had no choice. And a few minutes later, he bumped into the other brother who was the CEO of a Fortune 500 company and had a loving, blossoming family. And he had every advantage. And he asked him, like, how is your life so much different than your, your, your dad's life? And he said, well, you see, my father was an alcoholic. I had no choice. And the choice he made was, I can't possibly be what my dad was and what he presented. And the other brother is, I can't possibly see another way uh, to live my life based on the example I was given. But it's such a hard decision, especially, you know, growing up in those circumstances, because I, I mean, I certainly didn't like just snap out of it or, you know, decide when I was eight, like, I'm going to ignore all this, this garbage that's being shown me. You know, it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of people like yourself 
to help show the way and, and reveal what life could look like and then let them know those possibilities apply to them. They have the choice and they can pick those different things. Great story. Thanks for sharing that. Um, when someone comes into our office for services, um, we, they may be there just for us, assistance with a utility bill. But we know with poverty, there's a lot of factors that cause them to come into your office for assistance with utility bill. It's more than that utility bill. Mm -hmm. And so it does take a lot of work to break the cycles of poverty. It takes decisions like in your example you provided and choices. But what we also know is that there's more to the story. There's some systems and structures in place that keeps individuals, these oppressive systems and structures that keep individuals in a cycle of poverty. Now everyone's poverty is different. There's situational poverty, then there's generational poverty. Um, and it's up to you, like you said, the decision how hard are you willing to work to get out of it and how loud you want your voice to be heard. Um, so yes, decisions matter, but there's also structures in place to keep individuals oppressed and in poverty. Um, so oh, in your example, you, I'm sorry. Yeah, without a doubt, absolutely. Yeah, it's complicated. Like um, I have alcoholism in my family and you just gotta make that decision. Do I want to do this? Well, I have poverty too. So I knew that education was my way out of poverty. So I was determined to get an education and go to college, go to graduate school, postgraduate work. But I also knew I have alcoholism in my family. So I thought, Every time, you know, when you experience it as a child, you think, oh, this is what I'm not going to do. Mm -hmm. And so you make a decision consciously, consciously to get far away, like aversion, like get far away from it. Um, you just got to break the cycle. Yeah, you just got to make a decision. And um, a lot of excuses, like crutches. I tell people like, well, I didn't have a mother or father growing up. Now you're an adult. Now you understand that you didn't have a mother or father. Now you, the decision is on you. You got to decide what you're going to do about it. So I'm leading you down a rabbit hole. <laughs> you, can stop, you can stop me here. It's, it's choices and it gets deep and yeah, decisions. Yeah. Rabbit holes are allowed. We can definitely go down rabbit holes. But I know you wanted to talk about how you design a board and you wanted to talk about program development. And if you're listening to this and you haven't done so yet, there is a sweet PDF that we've got attached to this episode available for download that Tamisha has provided. So you can follow along with what we're talking about and, and take some notes and see how you can maybe implement this in your own world. And then if you have questions, you can always comment below or contact myself or Tamisha directly and be like, Hey, you guys talked about this and this was on the page, but I don't know how this applies to me. And I'm sure we'd both be more than happy to help you walk that through that process on a more individual basis. Yes. So you want to start with designing the board? Let's do it. How okay. do I, board? <laughs> I just started this thing up and I know oh, that I've got you know, a good vision and a good mission, but uh, I don't really, I've got a couple of people interested, but how do I know who should be on my board? Okay. Good question. So, um, for me, designing a board, I've been part of many boards and um, I've seen them operate working for a large nonprofit. Your board is very important in the nonprofit. They um, internally and externally, I'm sorry. Hold on. You, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, how embarrassing. Apollos, Ezra, I can hear you in here, babes. Okay, I'm recording. <laughs> Don't worry, my team will just take that out. It's not embarrassing. I got dogs right here, and if someone pulls into my cul-de-sac, they're going to go ape shit to let me know. <laughs> uh, this stuff just happens. It's not It's not going to be embarrassed about. Okay. They they just get so, like, you think it's 12 out there, and it's only two. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Designing a board. So in the nonprofit world, board plays an important role, and for most of them, they are volunteers. They are volunteers. You want two boys, Apollos and Ezra? They're eight and six. <laughs> okay. Uh, the nonprofit architect does not condone human trafficking or children for sale in any way. <laughs> so you, 
the board's role, let me get myself together. In a nonprofit, the board plays a very important role. They help govern and keep you financially responsible. And they also help externally, like your communication, your fundraising efforts. So the way you design your board is, is research has shown that board performance correlates with organizational success. So how well your board operates is, is an indicator of how successful your nonprofit would be. So how you recruit is very important. And this national conversation is happening around boards about increasing diversity. And it's more than just a black and white or more Latinos on your board. Diversity is surface level, the things we see, gender, race, ability levels, but it's that deeper level issue, which is attitude, beliefs, political beliefs, religion, the things that you cannot see. So you, when you're going after members for your board, just keep that in the back of your mind, diversity is more than race, because everyone brings these talents and differences that can just really strengthen your nonprofit. Oh, absolutely. And if you haven't done so already, check out the interview we did with Ned Murray. He talks about board governance. And one of the things he really likes to highlight is that you want to have someone, a person or two that have dissenting opinions, that have something opposite of what the group is thinking right now. You want to have those different point of views, whether they're dissenters or they have a different socioeconomic background and can see the problem, but they can see it from a different angle. And when you can see all the angles and you get a much more clear picture of what you're doing and what you need moving forward. That's so true. I just did a piece like for my audience, devil advocacy. It's Halloween time where we're talking about you need a devil advocate in your, your business, your workplace that dissent and make you look at it 360, whatever your, your question is that you bring to the table. Um, so where do you want me to go now? I get distracted. <laughs> <laughs> you can take that. I hope you can take that out. Are they in another room? They are in another room. Uh, and it, it sounds like they're right here. I'm so sorry. They are, you know, vocal, active boys, and I'm sure they're rough and tumble and doing all that fun stuff. And I'm just gonna have my team edit that out. And they're listening right now, and they're like, "Really, Travis? Yeah, really." Most of these interviews are way too easy for you anyway. We gotta, we gotta put some hard stuff in every now and again. And now they're probably gonna shoot me dirty looks. Like, <laughs> Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it at all. Do you like, do you have the, the PDF up in the background? I can pull it up. Yeah, that's gonna help you follow along the same as it will help ask me, me asking some questions. Okay, so there's four actions to design a board I'd like to share. Um, the first one is, Revisit your vision and mission statements. Oh yeah, absolutely. If you don't know what your vision and your mission is, how can you bring people on board to make sure that they're aligned with what you need? I know uh, somewhere in one of my PDFs, there's a board questionnaire or what to look for when, when looking for a board. Uh, feel free to download that and, and take a look and follow along and see how those questions might align with what we're talking about here. If the person in question that you're looking for to join your board isn't familiar with your organization, it's the first contact, they're going to need to understand where you're at with your mission and your vision to see if that aligns with their values or something that they're really passionate about. One of the most important roles that a leader can do is to share that vision with other individuals. You can be a startup and have zero employees, have zero dollars in the bank, and you can approach LeBron James with this idea of a vision of a nonprofit. And if you can sell anyone on your vision and your mission, they will say, yes, I want to be a part of your organization. Now also give the potential board member, when you design it a board member, the choice. Does this align with my personal values and mission? It gives them the opportunity to say yes or no, I will be a good fit. I can see how I can add value to your nonprofit. So revisit that vision and mission and make sure you're convicted of it and you can sell it to whoever you're approaching um, to join your board. The next step is to avoid the, the checkbox mentality. So many times that in the nonprofit sector, we have a checkbox. I want a board member who's connected to this bank. I want a board member who's connected to 
who is black, I want a female. We have these boxes that we like to check. Well, when we do that, we miss so many great individuals. We overlook so much talent. Um, so avoid the checkbox mentality. And you need to align your board recruitment process with your overall business plan. Um, focus on thoughtful, mean, meaningful, strategic approach. You know, every member that you go after, you got to see value in them. You got to see what strengths they bring to the table. You got to, whatever your, in your nonprofit, if you know you have areas of weakness, you want to recruit a board member that can strengthen those areas of weakness and challenge your thinking and push you to the next level. So the check boxes that we sometimes provide ourselves, it kind of limits our nonprofit ability. Oh, absolutely. And if you're a startup listening to this, a lot of times, uh, even though it's not recommended, people start with, you know, like a father-in-law and a spouse as your board members and yourself, and you've got you three. And what that looks like is it really is a, is a solo shop. You're running this thing by yourself without any input, checks or balances for the board. And that's not really, you know, what the IRS is looking for when you say that you have a board. And it's also not going to help you. You want people that are willing to come on and come on board and help you take some of the burden, take some of the workload off of you and help spread and develop your mission. If you've just got a, a couple of people that you happen to know or like, hey, be on my board, I won't have you do anything. Uh, how long is it going to be before you burn yourself out? How long is it going to be if you're like, I can't believe my board isn't helping? Well, did you tell your board what you would like from them. Did you tell them in person or did you have a board description in writing when they signed on that they would be following these things and you're responsible for these items? It's not just that, hey, I need somebody. Hey, you look good. Come on over here. It's, it's not that. If you do that and you have done that or you've talked to someone that's done that, you know that it's not the best way to help build and develop your board. And when you're more established, uh, what Tamisha is going to get into is creating a recruitment pipeline and what that might look like to start putting feelers out and developing new board members before they even come online. You mentioned just a great point, two points that you'll burn yourself out if you just bring someone on board and you're still doing all the work. But if you really truly recruit appropriately, your board members will want to take the load because they're compelled to the vision and mission and it won't, it will not feel like work. It, I'll, I'll be honored to go speak at this uh, gala. So um, you can really delegate tasks and be more efficient operation. And then you're recruiting your family members initially to be on your board as a startup. That's natural. That's a natural tendency to do because as humans, we tend to have a tendency to naturally surround ourselves with individuals who are like us. That's just common. You look at our group of friends, we're maybe diverse, but we probably have some more similarities than differences. And so you think, hey, dad, I need you. Hey, uncle, brother-in-law, come sit on my board. But that will limit, one, that can skew your objectivity and you can start making some decisions that are not the best for your organization. But um, so really look and spend time in how you're recruiting. And you may think, I'm a startup, I don't have any dollars. But if you sell your vision and mission, go to local colleges to recruit, um, grad students, you can go to post job announcement on these job boards that you're looking for. You're looking for board members. LinkedIn is a great resource. You do not have to spend a lot of dollars to, re to recruit high quality board members. Make sure you're reaching diverse populations. So are you reaching different ethnicities, different ability levels, different economic statuses? Um, are you reaching a different religion? You may think, well, I operate a nonprofit dog grooming. You still need diversity in your nonprofit. So make sure that where you're recruiting is diverse. And you will have to push yourself to think differently. Um, yeah, you can ask for word of mouth, but that would, word of mouth is faulty, is flawed. You think so many nonprofits get themselves in trouble or limit their diversity through word of mouth. It's the easiest way. Hey, do you know anyone who would be great on my board? Yes, I know this lady. She's talented. But word of mouth was great, like-minded people working together, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so. there's, a, there's an organization down here in Oklahoma right off the, the OU campus 
And their entire staff, volunteers, and board is made up of college students. So you've got the founder holding the executive director role. And the beautiful part about it is, is the students cycle through, but they, they're, they're a part of this thing. They can put on a resume. They can do good things, but then they're moving on with the rest of their life. So she has this constant influx of college students that are helping her firm and build her, her organization at, at all levels. That's the beautiful thing about boards. Um, if you're not bound by bylaws, you can design your board however you want to design it. So that's a beautiful thing. So I love that idea about college students because you get these new, fresh, like big vision ideas that comes with these young students. And it's like revolving, like it's always new, new, fresh meat, so to speak, on your board. Yeah, I mean, how old is, is your organization? You guys have been around for a few years, right? Started by Lyndon Johnson? Yes, we're about 50. We're approaching 55. 55. 55. You guys yes. are getting mail from AARP already. That's the, that's the <laughs> business, right? Yes, yes. And we are, we are one of the organizations as a community action organization. We do have bylaws that restrict our board members. We have one third from poverty, one third from the private sector, and one third from the public sector sector so a tripartite board which um you can get some people who are who've been on boards a long time i'm um, serving or you could be intentional and really try to avoid that and recruit differently um, but in that nonprofit world it's easy to place you know local bank presidents local nonprofit executive directors on your board. So you have to be intentional, even though you have bylaws to diversify your board. Um, and it takes plenty, it takes input from everyone, all employees. It takes input for the clients, customers you serve. Ask them, do you know anyone who may be a good fit for our board? Ask them to recruit for you. Um, interview your board members. Oh, Just don't say, hey, you're on the board interview them and it's okay to say no you may need a board member direct desperately but be picky yes you know i just got done reading jim collins from good to great and one of the main things they found with the companies that i mean they looked at tons of great companies tons of good companies but the ones that transition from good to great one of the first things they talk about is getting the right who on the bus before you do the right what and some people you interview for the board position, they might make great staff members. They might make great volunteers. Not everyone you're gonna interview is gonna be a good board member and there's nothing wrong with that. You're like, you know, uh, we filled up the spot on the board. I was wondering if you'd be interested in pitching in in this other area. There's nothing wrong with that kind of conversation and that needs to happen. There's, there's a time that I know me as a person was not a good fit for a board. And there was a time that I served quite well on, on a pair of boards. It has nothing to do with, with me. It has to do with the organizational needs. And sometimes you're just not in alignment and there's nothing wrong with turning down people or offering them another position within the organization. One of the most important questions you can ask to a potential board member or a potential board member may, may ask you, so you need to be ready to answer, is how can I add value? or how can you add value to my organization? And if they cannot answer that, you think, maybe they don't know enough about me, or maybe they're not the right fit, or maybe they cannot see themselves inside my nonprofit. So how can you add value? You're talking to a potential board member. And if you're being interviewed for, as a potential board member, you must always ask, how can I add value? Why are you recruiting me? You know, yeah. Why are you chasing me, seeking me out? How can I add value? So. Absolutely. And, you know, kind of my rule of thumb, and I've been doing this for a while, but I also don't know everything, is I'm under the opinion that people can offer time, talent, and treasure. And if they can offer you two of those three, they would probably make a good board member. But if they can only offer one, chances are they're maybe more suited to be a volunteer or some other place in the organization. Um, me as a board member, I might come in you know, knowing what I know about stuff and they might have a much different opinion about who I am and what I can bring to the board. Like if they're asking me like, hey, can you go on base and, and do recruiting for all these things because you're in the military? I can't really do that for you. There's some things I can offer, but I can't go uh, promote 
this specific nonprofit on base, it's, it's not allowed. So if you're trying to get me on board to get access to a military facility, mm-hmm. that's not really how that works. Mm-hmm. Um, now, if I'm a retiree or if I have another job, there's definitely some things that I can do and, and help build partnerships, but I can't just go, you know, throw a sign up and do recruiting on behalf of. So understand what you're looking for might not be in alignment with what they can actually deliver depending on restrictions like the military or something different. Yes. So that's why the onboarding process is so important. Um, you've got to have these, you need to develop board member descriptions, like job descriptions, how often you'll meet, what are the expectations, what subcommittees they'll work on. Even if you're a startup, you can develop a general description of expectations, the vision, the mission, how you align. Also, training for board members is very important. So once you bring them on, you need to train them, orient them to your nonprofit, um, and actually involve them in your strategic planning process. Involve them in your hiring of staff. Involve them in your fundraising. Involve your board members as much as possible in your organization so they can become part of the culture of your organization. So your own board and process is very important. Yeah, there's nothing worse than having showing someone show up to your organization, whether a volunteer, or board member, or otherwise, and them standing around with their hands in their pockets because they don't know what to do. They're not sure what the mission is. They're not sure what the vision is, and they're not sure how they fit into the organization or what their role is. Me being in the military, me being in the Navy, if I got a junior sailor that I haven't given a task to and I let them kind of go around the day and, and figure it out for themselves, they're going to get into trouble and in turn get me into trouble if they don't have a task to do. So if someone comes to your organization, their chances are they're gonna cause some problems or they're just gonna be ineffective because they don't know what you want from them. If uh, I learned from Jim Mattis, the three-step communication problem uh, process, what do I know, who needs to know, and have I told them? If I know as a board or as an executive director or as a founder what I want from you, and I haven't told you that I haven't communicated. I haven't done you any favors and I haven't done me any favors. I talked to an executive director down in the Tampa area. He's so excited. I love his mission. I love his passion. And he started talking to a few people and he's like, how come you never share any of my stuff? How come you never do any of this? How come you never do any of that? And I asked him, I was like, have you told them what you would like them to do? Have you shared with your followers or your board the best way that they can support you and he was like i actually haven't i was like i was like friend there's no possible way they can read your mind if they were mind readers they wouldn't be working for your organization they'd be making millions of dollars somewhere else you have to be able to tell people what you would like them to do and it doesn't matter what it is i know guys are very directive like if you come to me and you say hey, baby, there's like a sink full of dishes. I'll just say that sucks that we have a sink full of dishes because it doesn't mean anything to me. But if you said, hey, baby, can you do the dishes real quick? No problem. I can absolutely 100% do that for you. But I don't know what you mean if you say there's dishes there. Maybe after 20 years of marriage, I can figure that out. That's just not how guys communicate. Gals, on the other hand, most of the time, if you make a suggestion or you tell them about a situation, they know what to do. Mm -hmm. Um, So making sure that you are communicating on the right wavelength with the people you're trying to convey something to is very important. And I I dropped the 20 year mark because we only been married for 19. So I still have it. Oh, oh. (laughs) (laughs) good one. Yes. Like being being a board member is like being invited to a party and who likes to show up at a party and you're just standing around, you know, you think I I have something better else to do. So yes, directives, clear. Yes. Yeah. I like to show up at the party and be like, hey, I can do this, I can do that. Oh, this is so fun. Let me engage. But me as an introvert, if I do not have clear directions, I'm like trying to blend in with the wall. And then you'll see me like walk backwards at the door and get in my car and leave, you know, so. Yeah. <laughs> or you do that Irish goodbye where you were at the party <laughs> one minute. You're like, man, where did Misha go? Yeah. I'm like, hey, she left. You need to say goodbye. Um, that happens all the time. That's no big deal. So yeah. yeah, we've got the the framework of how to design the board, the process of figuring out how it should be there, the recruitment pipeline, and then the onboarding process where you tell them what their job is, what you like to do, and what the responsibilities are, and frame out the next task. So 
we've got the board stuff kind of set up where, the way that we want it, but how do I develop a program or how do I know if a program is, is needed? How do we go from scratch? This is perfect for startup nonprofits. Like okay. I have a big heart about veterans. What should okay. I do? How should I create a program? Or how do I even know what's needed? That's the first step, identifying a need or identifying a vision, things you like to happen in your community. And so program direct development is, is a cycle. It's, it is never ending. It's never ending. But the very first step is the vision phase. You know, it's a set of activities. So if you identify your need in the community through community assessments, that that's sometimes that's the easiest part to develop well, a program. Well, I want to I want to stop right there just a little bit and talk about that. You said you said community assessment. If I'm a new nonprofit, I might not know exactly what that means. So what do you mean oh. by community assessment? Okay, so this could be a formal or informal. Community assessment is talk to people. Maybe you have an idea, say, I don't know, a new food bank. You need to go to where people are currently receiving food assistance and say, are there any unmet needs that you cannot fulfill? Identify a need. If you have um, a group of individuals or clients, they'll willing to complete a survey, survey, a little, write up a survey, free survey monkey and send it out to individuals. So you can make this as elaborate or as simple as you like. But once you have a need, you need to go to and talk to people about it. You can talk to local homeowners or recipients or elderly who's homebound who may be in need of food. So assess your community formally or informally. Focus groups, sit, go to churches, go look at your newspaper, who's having a community meeting. So um, that's assessing your community. I know that's late, like professional term. Well, I, I'm, I'm sure that there's some area of, of legislation or the government that might uh, have, say, food shelters as part of a program. So there might be some elected official or an office that mm. deals with that problem, that thing you're trying to address that might have data for you. Absolutely. Oh, I'm so glad you're here. We have these communities covered. And actually, in your community, we, can, we already know that we have that need. And then you already know up front that the thing you're looking to do uh, is needed, or you might find um, you might find another area where they haven't. It, it was a line item in a budget, and it got passed over and wasn't included this year. Well, actually, we just had to cut out this service. But if you can raise money for this program and are able to provide it, then that service will keep being provided to the community. But you don't know unless you ask. You don't know unless you ask. And so many other nonprofits. Um, publish annual reports. So they publish their board notes on their website. So you can just get online and browse. You can search newspaper articles. Great news. Um, there's easy words out there. Yes, yes. Facebook, just keywords, Facebook, LinkedIn, social media, Twitter, hashtag. That's assessing your community, formally or informally, yes. Okay, so we've done but, our assessment. We figured yeah. out what the community wants. Now what? Yeah. Now, now you gotta build your foundation. And that includes, you gotta secure money, you gotta secure a place, you gotta secure the infrastructure that will make your program sustainable. And this is the, the foundation building. So this can include, once you identify your need, research funding opportunities, grants.gov, um, different grant making foundations. You can even go to your local city I've identified a need in the community. Can you include us in this year's budget? It may not can include you in this year's budget, but they have great dollars that you can go to the city and say, I need $10,000 and they'll put you on, on an upcoming agenda. Here's an immediate need in our community. So go directly to your city officials, your county officials, your state officials um, to chase those dollars to help support your vision. And you just show the data that you collected from your, your, your scouring the internet, the talking to individuals, to fund your program. If you do not have funding available, that's where your board comes into place. This is also in the foundation. This is where you recruit board members. Um, so you have an idea, you've done your community assessment, you have a vision and mission, but no money. Start recruiting those board members strategically. Go after banking individuals, go after individuals of diverse backgrounds and bring them together and share them 
and they can help you seek dollars. They may have resources that you do not have access to or you never have thought about. So this is where your board building skills come into play. You may have zero dollars in the bank, but you got this dynamic vision, rock solid mission, and if you recruit your board members appropriately, they will do all the hard work for you. They will do most of the heavy lifting for you. So your vision and your foundation building, now is the implementation. This is where you have the money. Now you gotta make things happen. You gotta deploy resources into the community. So this is where you write policies and procedures. You hire staff. If you don't have anything, any money to hire staff, this is where um, you are putting programs out there, you're holding events. This is your implementation phase. So your vision, your foundation building, your implementation, and this implementation phase is your most visible. This is where people notice, start noticing you. They'll see the work you're doing in the community. They will start, use social media, post what you're doing in social media. So this is your high visibility phase. Then there's the valuation. After all the work is done, you gotta see you're making great impact. So. Take a moment to pause with your board members. Are we on track doing what we set out to do? Mm -hmm. You can create a survey. Hopefully you have job descriptions in place. Are we in metrics already in place? Are we doing what we set to do? Are we meeting the need in the community? Go back to those individuals that you initially assess in the community and ask them, are we doing a good job? Yes or no. So the same way you initially assess your community, you will revisit that to see if that you're meeting that need now. So vision, foundation building, implementation, and evaluation. And then you start all over. <laughs> <laughs> you start all over with your vision, yeah. yes. I, I know it can sound daunting, but I mean, it makes sense, right? You wanna make sure that your, your need that you're wanting to fill is real and actual. You wanna make sure you have the funds and programming in place to where you, when you implement this thing, it actually does well and you get good and positive reviews. And then this constant evaluation process is like if you decide that you're going to do a winter coat fundraiser and now it's May, you might not be doing a winter coat drive. You might be, I don't know, getting bicycles for the community because now people are outside and they want to ride around. And there's going to be a time again where it's getting cold and you're going to switch back over to uh, getting winter coats. Maybe you're providing clothing to the homeless and the, the, depending on what area you're in, you've reached all the people and now they have a good set of clothes. And maybe they now have a new need that is coming up. They need to provide something different. Maybe a little addition, maybe a little tweak, maybe something much bigger. Now that they're all clothed, maybe you have them fed. Now that they're all fed, maybe you look into housing. Uh, maybe you're looking for partnerships with other organizations doing these things so you can work in tandem and parallel and build on each other's services and not compete. And you only find that out is if you go out and ask and see how things are going. Yeah, what could we do better? You can say, what can we do better? We provided you a winter coat. What could we have done better? Is there any other needs that are going unmet? So yes, that constant evaluation. And evaluation is just not one point in time. Evaluation is ongoing. So every code that you hand out, you need to survey every touch point in your whole operation all year long. Yes. And recognize for what you're doing well. Recognize individuals for a job well done. If you have volunteers working with you, if you have board members in the implementation phase, this is where you recognize them for the job well done. Your board members and clients that you're serving and community members. Yeah, absolutely. You got to make sure that the volunteers and the staff and people that are doing the hard work, whether it's you or the team, make sure you thank them appropriately. There's nothing like doing this whole cycle, getting a program built up, going through all the process, implementing and evaluating it, 
and there's no thank yous going out. Gratitude goes a long way inside and outside of an organization. It's got to be some of the foundation of who you are as an organization. Absolutely. And then the evaluation, there's two separate evaluations that you need to do. You need to evaluate your process. How's the process working? Is it efficient? Is it effective? But also the impact. That's going back to the pain community that you assess, the community assessment. So process implementation, process evaluation, and impact evaluation. Absolutely. So I know that you've got your master's in education and you're working on your, you started your doctoral work. Are you getting a PhD in education as well? PhD in education is focusing on organizational leadership. So um, in the education phase, so hopefully by 2021, I will have we'll my PhD. Doctor sales. <laughs> Doctor sales. Master sales. <laughs> <laughs> that almost sounds like a <laughs> yeah. So what's on the horizon for for you and the Community Action Partnership of North Alabama? What's on the horizon? Well, needs continue to evolve, especially with, with this pandemic. So we have funds that we need to use to help those recover. Well, those who are in the middle of the we're in the middle of a pandemic, so we have funds now. But you know what? needs are going to look very different after post pandemic. So we're trying to put a plan in place to help individuals re-enter the workforce, um, get back to school, health, housing. I mean, we addressed these needs before the pandemic, but now it's like quadruple. We do not have enough manpower or resources to meet the needs that are going because of the pandemic. So for strategizing for 2021 and beyond. What can we do as a nonprofit? And on the side, on my other job is just me personally, I consult and train with other nonprofits and schools and universities. So that diversity and inclusion and organizational management work is keeping me busy too. So that is what's on the horizon for me. And, you know, I love it when, you know, we talk to a guest and we go through what we're doing. And then they're implementing it at the same time. They're doing the things that they talk about. And that is just fantastic. Uh, and I wish you the best. Hey, tell our guests, tell our, our listeners where they can get a hold of you if they've got questions on how to implement all this stuff. Everyone can find me on LinkedIn and Facebook at Tamisha Sales. Um, also, they can join my email list by texting 22828-ECSLIST. To two two eight two eight. You get it? Text ECS list to two two eight two eight. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's phenomenal. Hey, thank you so much for being a guest today on the Nonprofit Architect. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure.